This is the field of honor outside the Airborne and Special Operations Museum here in Fayetteville. Every year during May and June, family members and friends purchase these flags in memory of service members who pay the ultimate sacrifice. You know, freedom isn't free. Just ask any member of the military who's been in combat and made it home with a battered body able to tell his or her story. It's early Saturday morning and these members of the North Carolina Patriot Guard are on a mission. They ride their motorcycles and pass out flags to honor men and women returning from war. Flag always stands up straight and tall. We don't dip it. We don't move it around. When we move with a flag, it is not furled. This is today's honoree. He's Timothy Donnelly, a young infantryman from 1st Battalion, 6 Marines, stationed at Camp Lejeune. He arrived at the Fayetteville Regional Airport to find the Patriot Guard standing at attention and Old Glory painting the breeze against a chilly Carolina sun. A year ago to the day, Timothy nearly lost his life. He stepped on an IED while on a mission, similar to this one, with his unit in Afghanistan. We were patrolling an area that another squad had patrolled the day before, and uh, we were walking past a, a point where they'd, they'd taken you know, a five minute break and, and rested for a minute. And um, basically overnight somebody planted an IED there, uh, hoping, you know, uh, hoping the same squad would come back and, and rest there again or, or something. Um, and we walked right on by it and uh, I was right in the middle of the squad. So um, basically once it, once it got to me, um, somebody who was watching us set it off. The young Marine survived, but lost both of his legs and seriously injured his right arm. He will have to undergo multiple surgeries, and there's no guarantee he will ever get normal use of that arm again. Bullets don't discriminate, and neither do uh, explosives, so uh, they'll take anybody they can. And um, I just happen to be the next one on the list. We thank you for Tim, Lord, and his recovery and his will and his family support that he has, and Lord just be with him today and make this a wonderful day for him. This is called a live day. It's how wounded warriors celebrate the one year anniversary of that event that broke their bodies. It's how they demonstrate their spirit is intact and they're alive and getting better. Um, this is something I've been wanting to do for a long time from before the Marines, before you know all this, so uh, it's, it's really cool to get the chance now. Timothy is getting his chance to skydive. It'll be a tandem jump from 10,000 feet attached to the belly of this guy. Unbelievable. You know, who could think of a better way to, to celebrate and, and uh, get back into the swing of things? I mean, uh, just, a, just a, uh, a monumental step for him as a, as a, as a person, as a soldier, and, uh, and uh, just a great opportunity all the way around. And Timothy has pretty much always pushed the limits from the time that he was toddler so in terms of physical stuff but he's incredibly coordinated incredibly capable and so um, you know I kind of learned probably in his teenage years that the best thing I could do was just not to look <laughs> you know because yeah otherwise you know I'd be doing the mom thing. Catherine Donnelly couldn't help but do the mom thing a year ago when she got word that her son was severely injured by a bomb. The mom thing was a mess. Um, and it was extremely, extremely hard to hear. And, uh, and Greg can tell you I was pretty hysterical there for the first, the first little bit. Before uh, he was even a teenager, as an early teen, preteen even, he wanted to be a Marine. The family knows Tim is physically strong, and they say he's mentally tough. His father says Tim could have easily gone to college and gotten a commission to become an officer in the Marine Corps. Instead, Tim enlisted and was determined to move up the ranks by first proving himself a worthy warrior. Uh, so what will be the biggest challenge uh, for a no double amputee who has limited use of one arm as he attempts his first tandem parachute jump from 10,000 feet? I think the biggest thing is going to be mental. Uh, physically, he'll be able to handle it, not a problem. Mentally, you know, to, to, to just get back outside the box and, and come up with a, with, a, with a physical challenge, a personal challenge, a mental challenge. All those things uh, contribute to, uh, to uh, you know, a little, bit of, a little bit of fear factor, of course, a little bit of performance anxiety. So I think, uh, I think it'll all be mental. All right, just remember to smile, thumbs up, I'll see you outside.
What'd you think of that one, man? That's what I'm talking about. Good job. Excellent. All right. You kicked ass. Hey, man, that was freaking awesome. <laughs> Excellent job. Excellent job. <laughs> Yo, Phil. Up there, man? Oh, man. Nah, not much more than that. Uh, just a huge adrenaline rush. <laughs> that was awesome. The Field of Honor is an appropriate and fitting backdrop for Tim's powerful story. You know, you don't have to wait until these flags are out here, Memorial Day or Veterans Day, to thank a service member for what they've done for our country. It's something we should and can do every day. The Gilbert Bays Report is powered by Supermix Media. I'm Gilbert Bays on the World Wide Web. What in the world is going on today in Fayetteville? Our crews in Fayetteville were among the first on the scene last night. And Gilbert Bays is live on I-95 right now. And Gilbert with When news happens in Fayetteville, WRAL's Gilbert Bays takes you there. Gilbert, we understand there was another shooting involving teenagers right where you are. Fayetteville reporter Gilbert Bays has been following developments in this amazing story. Put news leadership to work for you today on WRAL TV 5. Go! Chow! Zero six hundred! Formation zero seven forty five! Rise and shine! Meet the men and women of the 312th Evac Hospital from Greensboro. Four hundred and fifty members strong. They're still standing tall and still providing medical support for our soldiers in the Gulf. Your morale has been good, and I think we're over the hill. I think every day we're here is a day closer to going home. This is an Army Reserve unit. Back in North Carolina, these men and women are doctors, nurses, mothers, fathers, and students. Here, somewhere in the middle of nowhere, they're soldiers whose lives have been forever changed by events half a world away from what they consider reality. We were living in a place like Mars. <laughs> we're in a compound that we can't get off of it. And we have a berm around it, and everybody knows about what's happening in the news, but we do. You know, we've got cold showers and cold meals, and, but we're really okay. It's not as bad as we thought it was going to be. Some days. Some days, <laughs> some days it's worse. My nine-year-old thought it was exciting at first because Mom was going to wear combat boots and go off and be G.I. Joe, and he wanted to wear, you know where my gun was, and he thought it was real neat that I got to sleep in the top bunk of a bunk bed at Fort Bragg. These ladies call themselves the nurses from and in hell. They didn't know each other well before this all happened. That's all changed now. We cook for each other, we clean after each other. Um, we do everything as a group, as a team. Most of the shows on TV, China Beach, MASH and all that, don't show nurses working as much as we do. We work a lot here. Sergeant Thorpe, Sergeant Thorpe, report to the orderly room. Sergeant Thorpe, report to the orderly room. Some of us were in the hospital working, and then all of a sudden we heard Mass Cow, and 450 people responded. They ran to the hospital. People moved. I mean, they were just here to help the prisoners. They were here to help the soldiers. And the thing was, whenever a chopper would land, we didn't know who was on it. But it didn't matter. You were still running anyway. You were running to help them. When the ground war began, the 312th Evac Hospital cared for our soldiers and for hundreds of wounded Iraqi POWs. They thought we were going to treat them the same way that they treat our people. Yeah. They just didn't realize how human we really were. You could really tell that they were glad to be here. It was a weird feeling. And the only English half of them knew was thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. The 312 Evac Hospital was set up to handle thousands of casualties from the war. The folks who work here are glad they didn't have to. I don't believe you're going home. We know we can do it if we had to, but we're happy that for all those families back home, that their young men, their brothers, their sisters, their boys, their husbands. You got it? Yeah. Don't hurt your arm. They're going to come home, and they didn't get hurt. Attention in the compound, attention in the compound, Sergeant Mahan. Life is somewhat back to normal now, at least as normal as it can be living in the middle of the desert. The experience has changed the lives of these men and women from North Carolina. With photographer Art Howard, I'm Gilbert Bays, WRAL TV5 News, Saudi Arabia. Every military operation has a beginning. Operation Restore Hope in Somalia began with Marines storming the beach and securing the airport in Mogadishu. Members of the 624th Combat Control Squadron from Pope Air Force Base were part of the first wave of Americans to land in Somalia. I uh, immediately knew that just from the initial assessment we were going to have a problem controlling the crowd in order to get the airfield or the 
the air operation underway. This airfield has been secured for several weeks, ever since the Marines landed. Behind me you can see tons of equipment. Many of these pallets will be loaded on C-130s and shipped out to outlying areas. And then every day, hundreds of Somalis gather at the front gate, looking for food, searching for hope. The combat controllers from Pope are able to sustain themselves for about four days before they need to be resupplied. After establishing the air operations, it's on to the next phase of their mission. Well, to be honest with you, I'm unemployed. I'm awaiting tasking to go to a little dirt strip. Uh, I believe it's north of here, out in the middle of nowhere. Tonight at 11, we'll continue our story with the 624th Combat Controllers from Pope Air Force Base. With photographer Mark Copeland, I'm Gilbert Bays, WREL TV5 News, Mogadishu. Some of the people died instantly. WREL's Kurt Autry and Gilbert Bays have been covering this tragedy all day. Let's go to Gilbert first. Gilbert, what about these locked doors, supposedly? What are the investigators well, saying about that? Charlie, this is indeed a tragedy. The doors that were locked are in question are surrounding the building. I'm standing out in front of one right now. Uh, one of the other problems, not only were the doors locked, but a big uh, trash disposal unit was pushed back where the uh, employees normally dump trash. They had to get a dump truck in order to pull that out before they could get some of the victims out. This is indeed a terrible tragedy down here. The death toll at 24, and that may climb even higher. Because the doors were locked, the employees were trapped inside the building filled with smoke. The tragic accident happened early this morning. The first shift had only been working for a couple of hours when the explosion ripped through the chicken processing plant here in downtown Hamlet. Bernard Campbell was in the plant when the explosion happened. He says he's lucky he made it out alive. They worked with gas back there, and uh, he was fixing on something running the line back there, and it blew up. It blew up in his face, and he died on the scene. And uh, a lot of black smoke came and came rushing up to the front. Officials say it wasn't the explosion that killed most of the victims. Officials say doors bolted on the outside, trapped most of the employees who died of smoke inhalation. Hamlet is a small town. Many family members stood helplessly by, watching as victims were pulled out one by one from the rebel. Sam Breeden happened to be passing the plant when he saw his sister-in-law trapped at a locked door, gasping for air, trying to get out of the building which was spewing smoke. The vents are to a, a, to a portion of the, uh, the building away. It's, it's, it's aluminum but it wasn't enough to get her free and and during that time there were some other people on the inside beating against the wall trying to get out it appears that many of them were uh, trying to save themselves by going into the freezer the last group that we brought out were in the freezer and we were able to salvage about two but they look critical now it is unclear why the doors were locked from the outside employees say it was to stop people from stealing chickens plant officials had this to say about the locked doors uh, I'd have to see which ones were locked or not, and I can't tell you that right now. Uh, there are plenty of doors that were open. Uh, that's all I can tell you. Now, Charlie, of course, the death toll at 24, 41 individuals were injured, and some of those are critical, so the death toll may continue to climb.